Um, it's my sort of path here came via a um, an art exhibit at City College after I got a phone call from a, a local minister who knew me from the collaborative work, and he said that um, there were two folks from Cambridge, um, Aaron Rosen and Katrina Lang, who graduates of this program, who were doing a citywide art exhibit on of the Stations of the Cross during the days of Lent, promoting a, a closer view of immigration and refugees, and essentially the psychology of place and the psychology of home. And we were able to, with Katrina's uh, help, um, do a, a critical reasoning session looking at scriptures as regards to immigration um, in at a school filled with immigrants. And we had Hindu and Muslim and uh, Christian and Jewish people reading together. So all of this happened. And I mentioned to Aaron that I was uh, due for a sabbatical. And he said, well, you should call Giles. And Giles took the call. Um, and <laughs> graciously, we came up with a lot of uh, realizing a lot of shared uh, kinship in the how we sort of look at how to do the work and Daniel Weiss agreed to be my mentor. So I'm really incredibly grateful to be beginning these three terms here. So I look forward to more conversations, collaborations, and a lot of learning from you because part of what I'll be emphasizing today is what mental health care needs more of is spiritual vocabulary because that's the vocabulary that's a lot more useful to people with lived experience of mental illness. Um, so I have a need for this to work. Um, there we go. I have three tasks that I wanna to do today. I wanna to offer applied examples of the utility of the ineffable to person's mental health. I wanna briefly describe a lifespan development model of culture. So, you know, we, we have a lot of shared interests here in this room, which I'm very excited about. I'm also acknowledging beforehand that I will be, you know, skipping like a rock over the surface of things you all have gone very deeply into. And so I look forward at the end for us to kind of delve more into the depths and, and know that I'm, I'm using the top of your knowledge as tools to go deeper into mental health care. Um, and then I'll be talking about our public health model of clergy outreach and professional engagement, which seeks to build bridges across recognized borders between clinical science and religion. So the first step is identifying the borders. Um, and then hopefully concluding by showing how COPE and um, CIP uh, share um, kind of a DNA in working to build partnerships of difference in the service of advancing universal social flourishing. And so through the talk, I'm, I'm hoping you'll um, kind of keep this image in your mind that to do this work, you're in constant struggle to balance um, very specific knowledge, very specific culture, a specific approach with this goal of understanding the, you, you've got two facts that you're balancing. You're balancing the fact of a universal humanity with the facts of many different cultures and languages and ways of understanding that universality. So what do I mean by the utility of the ineffable? Fortunately, again, acknowledging that I'm skipping off the top of a lot of your expertise, uh, the Cambridge uh, English Language Dictionary has on the webpage, the uh, English corpus, where they give this um, phrase that really helped me be able to explain what I experience when I'm speaking to people using a spiritual language when talking about their lived experience with mental illness. Differing a sublime yet accessible infinity from an infinity that's beyond reach. And so hopefully you'll hear in the three voices that we're gonna uh, see um, how they use this vocabulary of this idea of an accessible infinity that explains the dysfunction, the pain, and the disarray that can accompany mental illness, along with how their personal faith helps them describe their community connections as foundations of hope. Um, and so when you hear their vocabulary, try to put your place in the, in the, your space in the place of the clinician, trying to think about how I bridge my clinical lexicon to another person's spiritual vocabulary. 
and why bother? Um, and even if I do, how will I know that I understand what that person is saying? And finally, what would a spiritually inclusive intervention that stays on my side of the border look like? Um, now I wanna let you know that there are many, many people doing exactly this kind of research, many psychologists doing spiritual, looking at spirituality and psychotherapy, looking at these kinds of things. Um, and obviously the, these are still huge questions and it's not yet in any way a part of clinical training. So a young man with schizophrenia, when describing his schizophrenia said, look, the biomedical model of mental illness has contributed significantly to our understanding of mental illness, but little to true recovery. This is a person with mental illness. Um, and, and please also know, I'm, I'll be more than happy to show these slides and, and obviously the things we've written uh, and should be in touch. He says, while medications may help one's behavior become acceptable to society, um, you can think of it as turning down the volume of, of the difficulty that someone's happening. They do nothing to put one's shattered soul back together. He's being very explicit. He's laying, he's put a marker, he's, he's laying down a marker, right, for the clinician. Here's my problem. Here's what I'm experiencing. If you're going to understand me, figure out what I mean by shattered soul. Or, which is what we'll be talking to later, find a, another expert you can be in conversation with around that. So we can bridge clinical treatment for acceptable behavior with healing for a shattered soul. I was part of a research team with Peter Guarnacci, who's a psychiatric anthropologist. And the project was to interview people who were the primary caregivers of people with mental illness. And we asked one mother if she, saw, she thought that her son's mental illness would ever be cured. And she answered us. She said, si Dios hace la obra, él se va a sanar aunque los doctores digan. Él va a ser así siempre. If God performs the deed, does the old work, he'll get better, even though the doctors say he will always be like this. So how do we engage people whose strength to care is sustained through their faith? Again, this is why I'm, I'm, I'm really honored and pleased to be here and to have the time this year, because I'm counting on you guys to help me get better at communicating with this mother. And then we um, put together a conference. This was with the Community Mental Health Center in Denver. And we got people with um, lived experience of mental illness. And there were three people, each of whom brought their clinician and their clergy to this half day meeting. And they spoke about their experience and how each of these uh, people helped them in different parts of their way and how they knew about each other, though a couple of them met for the first time that day at this half day conference. And you watched how the person <laughs> needing care was managing, you know, being the one in charge of the care through these multiple resources. And you saw in, in life what that looks like. And part of what they said was they, in. And they absolutely use the clinical care. They absolutely use the advantages of what, what it could be, be it medication, be it psychotherapy. What motivated them came more from their faith, came from a connection to an accessible infinity and, and ineffable. And one young woman who had suffered greatly from bipolar disorder, who was at risk for self-harm, said she, she got motivated to take care of herself in a clinical way because she now really understood that God does not make junk. That was her insight from her faith. So I, I want you to, again, from a psychologist's perspective, think of the cognitive complexity of what's gone on for me to be able to have this conversation. She's placed herself within a creative project of an ineffable relationship of her faith. There are products in that project that have value and place. All of it, this is all ineffable, essentially, right? It's ephemeral, certainly. 
Yet that is what's motivating her to change her behaviors toward health. That's why I need to be in that conversation as a clinician. So we've got good news and bad news about the fact that religion is powerful. It can be supportive when people find affirmation. It can be painful as the man who talks about his shattered soul when they feel a loss of connection. Religion also can be detrimental when it is rejecting, when it denigrates. So what's also kind of astonishing about all that power and all that motivation and all that organizing of the self is that at the beginning, we're born empty of that. Right? I, I, I think of, for me, these are five astonishments of culture that we're born empty. We, we're, we're void of, of any cultural rules that mediate our survival. We don't have language, we don't have social expectations. We're not born with group loyalty. We're not born with this religion. We're not even born with a football team. Even though some of your families may say that it actually you were born. Um, nevertheless, we're born ready to be anywhere. A, a, a healthy human brain born today could be nurtured into any culture, right? It could be um, brought up in any place and raised without accent. Um, and Santayana said, you know, what religion, I'm going to say, a person shall have is a historical accident, quite as much as what language a person can speak. And culture is incredibly efficient, right? Just a small fraction of a culture's huge vocabulary is all someone needs to function in the culture. Benjamin Beit Halachmi has noted, most persons learn anything they need to know about their inherited tradition by the time they're 10. And with just that amount of knowledge, there'll be a cascade of beliefs and rules of conduct, and it'll be tenacious, right? So you've got this very efficient process that also is incredibly tenacious, right? So we've got ubiquity, right? It's everywhere. We've got this tenacity based on so little. And then it's also plastic. We also can change. People convert. People change their religion. People immigrate and do a huge change. I'm standing in front of you because I still remember to say, ride on the left, ride on the left, ride on the left when I get on my bicycle. And I was able to do that because that's not my natural place when I'm on the road. And with all of that power, culture's so fragile, right? If if it's not taught, there's not an adult who can teach it. If there's not children able to learn it, it doesn't matter how long that culture has been here. It can disappear in a generation. All that's going on at once. All that's coming into you. And the way that it's easiest for me to, the tool I'm gonna to use to describe how it comes into you and, and to therefore also look for clinical application is from the stage development process. So. The one thing I want you to know is right now, this year, um, Cambridge University Press just published this small book by a colleague, Anne Annette Mahoney, who is um, part of the American Psychological Association, uh, the Division of Psychology and Religion, and has an extensive, and again, I, I can send you all these, this information. Um, this has an extensive review of the literature on, first of all, on development itself and on the development of religion. Um, and so I'm going to do a stage theory. I'm going to be speaking about Eric Erickson's view of stages, acknowledging that that's the tool I'm using for this. I'm not giving you the 2021 update on the most recent research on development, though it's accessible. So Eric Erickson said, look, here's my eight stages. Here's my eight processes. We're going to look at development across the lifespan in 64 categories. We will not be doing that today. But again, I need you to know what we're, what we're pulling from. You know, he spent decades in observation, in thought, in research. Um, and the thing that Erickson did, Erickson who came out of a Freudian training, he was analyzed by Anna Freud. 
He babysat for the Freudians. Um, he very much saw himself as a son of Freud. Nevertheless, focused on culture and culture transmission. And um, Anna Freud at one point accused him of being a sociologist. So he, he's got these stages, but he has processes. He says, any stage is happening in the bulk in three places at once. It's happening in your body, it's happening in your environment, and it's happening therefore in you. You know, you've got the organization of your physical, which grows in, in a staged way. You've got the environment that you're born into, as we said before, it could be anywhere. And so your trajectory is gonna be a function. The other key thing that Erickson says out loud that not a lot of developmental psychologists do is he says, oh, and you're born at a moment in history. Right? Very often we sort of get these universals and we forget how, I mean, you know, look what we just lived through. Um, and it's gonna take us a number of years to figure out what just happened and what the impact of being in your developmental stage, whichever stage you are, during a plague. And then you put those together and it's the nurtured nature that's you. So in a, you could really have an equation of soma plus ethos is psyche. And so if we just take four stages and we look at infancy, where we know a lot is happening in terms of attachment and where our, Erickson argues, you have the strength of hope development or the difficulties of withdrawal, the inability to make relationships. Um, and again, hope as a foundation. During school age, six to 12, give or take, is when you're learning the rules. You know, how do you play soccer? How do you, excuse me, football? Um, how do you um, play chess? What does a good outfit look like? How do I do my maths? How do I write a sentence? You know in my ethos. Adolescence is where you decide which of it's you. And then what, again, a very understudied part is adulthood when you're making a huge number of choices about what you're gonna pass on to keep culture going. You know, every family that's raising children is doing an active set of um, pruning, if you want, pruning and growing, gardening. As they, just, as they move culture on in a generative way. Um, so built on that foundation, built on the idea that people through a lifespan are receiving, being nurtured into a culture. And given that first, there's this ubiquity of religion in so many different parts of humanity. And given, as we saw in the people's expressions, how powerful it can be. Um, when I interviewed that mother and she spoke about, um, si Dios hace la obra, God does the work. She, was, she wasn't telling a story, she was describing herself. The question was, how can clinicians connect to that? And, and how can we, rather than do it all ourselves, Build a model of um, build a model that gain, uses the other person's expert uh, and the another set of experts. Sorry. So if you look at it developmentally, you see that religion exists in people's lives, not most people's, but where religion exists, it can often be there from the first day through these developmental stages. So it can be a powerful source of hope and affirmation and rejection and denigration. And there are people who felt shame from early, people who we know were traumatized by the, at this point, I think it's hundreds of thousands. That's a trauma that's that much harder. Um, the other thing that's really crucial to, to that I, I really wanna enca encapsulate here is that when we talk about mental illness, so again, I'm talking about serious mental illness, though it can be of a lot of different kinds it usually doesn't happen until young adulthood. Late adolescence, young adulthood is when the greater amount, you know, there's certainly adolescent and even, I, I worked at Bellevue Hospital and I worked on the child unit and saw 10 year olds with clinical depression and didn't think that existed until I was on the unit. Um, nevertheless, from an epidemiological perspective, most of it happens later 
the paradigm is the person who's been incredibly functional and in first year of university has a break. Now, one of the things you encounter when you speak to a parent at that moment is not only sadness, but an, an anger and a, they're fighting because that's not my child. My child is an artist. My child is brilliant at math. My child is a musician. And now my child's in university. How could my child be up in the bedroom talking to angels and refusing to come down? In other words, there's a lot that's already there before dysfunction happens. And, and one of the problems that's happened with the medicalization of no healthcare is, you know, if I'm a, a virologist and I'm going to treat you for your infection, essentially I'm, I'm in battle with the virus and I need to know the lifespan of the virus and I need to get the virus out. Of if I'm going to work with you on your mind, I also want to know where your mind came from and your lifespan and your, um, can I offer the possibility of a reclamation of early resources? Do I need to assess for harm? from early on. Um, so would it make a difference to reach out to religious congregations to try to partner with mental health centers and religious congregations? Could we build a continuity of care? Is that a worthwhile activity? Um, now, as I said before, it's been magnificent uh, being here with you, you guys, people here have been incredibly gracious and curious and I've had lunches and teas and just the real ability to have conversations with folks. And one of the um, things that people really need me to hear is the level of secularization in the United Kingdom. You know, well, that might work where you're from. Um, and I'm, and I want to go through some data and It'll be interesting to see um, what that looks like in the UK. What I can tell you in the United States is that across the United States, there are 344,894 congregations. We have agencies that count this, and this is an undercount um, because a lot of African-American uh, churches did not respond. Um, that means that in West Virginia, You've got a church, religious congregation for every 420 people. And even in Nevada, for every 1,942 people, when you break it down by population. Um, but of course, it's not that there are just a lot of churches. There's churches, there's mosques, there's temples, there's synagogues. There's 236 denominations that are identified in the United States, right? That's 236 worldviews multiplied by the individual interpretation of what I see my religion to mean to me in the pews. What there are not is 236 different treatments for depression or anxiety or psychosis. Right? We're, we're getting better and better at mental health care. We're getting better and better at understanding, treating the whole person with biological interventions as well as with therapy. What we're not great at is knowing what they do outside of our treatment facility, our office. So the goal with COPE was to build and sustain this continuum of mental health care, bridging borders. And one of the things that's happened over the years of, of working this program is at first we talked about boundaries and boundaries were just not fluid. Enough. And this was before all of the pushback on immigration. So borders are designed to be something you move to. Um, and so we're still gonna use that. Between clinical sciences and communities. So we, um, look to teach clergy when to make a referral and also to teach clinicians when to ask about religion and when even to reach out to congregations or to clergy because we've got three core principles on this. 
that clergy have specific expert knowledge, not interesting knowledge, not adjunctive knowledge, expert knowledge about religion and culture. Clinicians and research scientists have specific expert knowledge about assessment and treatment. And if we work together, we're gonna to reduce both of our burdens at the congregation when there are people who are suffering and also at times interfering with the, the function of the community itself, if you can make a referral, or if you're in a situation where you're, you as a clergy are just worried and can look, reach out for an assessment, that reduces your burden. As a clinician, the hardest point is, when does therapy end and then what? And have I asked about what else is in a person's life? And do I have resources in the community that I can reach out to to build a bridge with? And so the model itself is built on the National Institute of Mental Health prevention science paradigm. Um, what do you guys see? Four hexagons. Four hexagons. And what attributes do we notice about the hexagons? They have six sides, yes, they do. Every, all four hexagons have six sides. They what? They're all, they're blue, yeah. They're getting smaller. And what's the other change that's happening? What's that? Right, right. The shading is increasing, right? And what you have there are two epidemiological representations. The first has to do um, with the idea that we have different um, stages of health. And when we're unwell, there's fewer of us involved. So to, to put it a different way, universal prevention has to do with how we promote wellness. Are you getting enough sleep? Are you eating right? Um, are you exercising? If you do those three things, you're already improving your physical health. You're also improving your mental health. It's a prevention that pertains to everybody. Similarly, the other thing that's important is to have friends and to be able to be a friend. You know, all, there's data on all of this in terms of health. The most important variable for health is that you have access to clean water, which has this, again, there's that balance, right? You need to get clean water, but for you to have clean water, there needs to be a social contract to provide access to everybody. Selective is when we have stresses in our life, which all of us have. And then how do we respond to stress? You know, what do we do to you know, take care of ourselves? Indicated is when you've reached a level of dysfunction. And some mental illnesses are chronic. And so how do we keep relapse from happening? So <clears throat> they get smaller because there's a smaller percentage of the population that's in any one of those states at, at that moment. And the shading increases to represent the increased severity. And this was a paradigm shift, um, which I can get into uh, during questions, that said, we're gonna look at where the risks are, where in the population the risks to target interventions for prevention of mental health problems specifically. So we then mapped this onto um, the kinds of uh, issues that you will have, and then how that relates to people who are part of a religious congregation. So, in a religious congregation, you're part of a, of a uh, you're part of a community. Also, in the in the simplest way, it's something that gets you out of bed once. It also gets you somewhere. It also gets you in um, in act activity with people. And if you're an adult, it gives you many opportunities to be generative, whether you have a family or not. Um, the other thing that happens in a religious community is when there is um, what we know to be a near universal stress of loss. You know, as long as, as far as I'm concerned, as long as there's been humanity, we've been asking about loss and we've been responding. 
And so from a clinical perspective, religions have been developing interventions for this major stressor of loss for as long as there's been religion. And that's, and most of the time that people get better. So then you have a time where first, you know, the experts on grief and bereavement are clergy because clergy see much more of it than a clinician, which means, and we've done this training. I was, I was do, talking about COPE to the Queen's Psychiatric Society. And when I was talking about this, they said, well, so what we need to do is train clergy on the diagnostic and statistical man or the ICD. Um, and there was like, no, 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 they're already experts. They don't need to learn from us. They simply need to know that this is worse than normal and could very well get worse. So do I have someone I can call? Do I have a referral? And a lot of clergy do, a lot of clergy have a Rolodex. You know, they know who they can call to make that kind of a referral. Now, part of what they wanna know is that when they make that referral, there'll be respect on the other side. Um, one of the profound encounters I had was at a conference where um, I was approached by a minister and he said to me, look, I am a shepherd. This is my flock. If I pick up the phone and call you, how do I know how you're gonna treat my flock? Now that's not every theology and that's not every community. For this minister, that was his approach. And most probably for a lot of his congregants, that was their expectation as well, that if he was making a referral, they could really count on it being a, con a continuity. That doesn't mean that I had to believe everything he believed. And therefore, will I as a, cl as a clinician also reach back if it makes sense, if the person's given consent, um, if it's a positive place, will I as a clinician see that as part of my work? to reach back, especially because if you're talking about chronic mental illness or substance abuse, relapse prevention is the main thing that's done. Keeping people from re-experiencing that is one of the biggest uh, challenges that you have. So we've actually seen this right on our tellies. Um, I don't know how many of you have watched the UP series, 7, 14, 21, if you want to watch human life over time, it's an extraordinary experience. And one of the folks who are part of the 7-Up series, the Up series, is Neil Hughes. And so you see him as a young boy, a vibrant chess playing young boy who wants to become an astronaut. And then you watch as mental illness joins him. And you watch his very struggles over time. And one of the keys of his um, wellness is his deep involvement in his church as a lay preacher. Um, he also is a politician. And he at one point was on council. Um, right now, right now, there is a podcast being made in 2021 called On the Ward. And it's actually set at St. Andrew's Hospital. Um, and there's a nurse there who is interviewing patients about their time. And some of them speak about role of religion in their wellness. And so I can definitely recommend each of these if you want to see examples of what I'm talking about here. So I'm going to try to finish up quickly here. We, so if you take that big picture, you can now see that we can see and think explicitly, I've mentioned this, of three pathways. Now this, I, I, I have long conversations with my colleagues about, um, you know, there's all this research on clinical care and clinical outcomes and how we help someone with problems get better, which is crucial. But as we noticed before, the vast majority of us, um, vast majority is most of the time are not ill. We have healthy living, we have stressors, our community, family supports, resolve the stress, and we're back to healthy living. 
right? This is the health pathway. And if, if this pathway goes through your religious congregation, which it often does, if you've lost someone and you mourn them and you get both people bringing casseroles to your house to help you, you know, so you're not cooking. And then also you have a life in your cultural language that provides spiritual coherence for this kind of loss. That can be enough and usually is. This epidemiology has not been studied. To put it very frankly, the billions of dollars saved in health costs by normal living, by not being alone in those moments of stress, needs to be calculated. It's, and I can assure you, it's really hard to do, right? It's really hard to measure normal. Um, and the biggest challenge of prevention science is that the essence of prevention science is to achieve nothing, right? And this is the nothing that needs to be measured. So what I can do is I can offer you a model that makes sure we give it its due. And then there's the point where someone does need clinical assessment and treatment and um, some dialogue. In one of the psychiatric hospitals where I worked, we had a patient who was Hindu who was refusing to eat. And he wanted to explain that it was part of his fasting regimen within his belief. And so we called his guru who got on the phone and explained to him that harming his well-being was against their religious tenets. It was still a process to get him eating well. We had an ally in the clinical care, speaking to right, the accessible infinity, using a language of the ineffable that's not part of my vocabulary. And this is your assessment and treatment pathway. This is what, you know, the bulk of what we think of when we think about clinical care. Someone got ill, someone got better. What we have to remember is when they got better, they then went to a path, a journey that's theirs. And finally, people who have chronic illness, and that's what you'll hear when you, if you go to the on the ward, um, they um, could go in and out of depression, schizophrenia, and you really need all hands on deck. And so, you know, this was really where I was coming from. I, working 10 years in psychiatric hospitals, seeing people leaving a hospital, but not having anywhere to go. Um, I actually called uh, the nurse, um, John, who does the podcast and we were talking about this. And he said, you know, one of the phenomena is when you're talking about a, an inpatient hospital where people could be for years, very often they arrive, they could be hundreds of miles from their home. So having a local church that they recognize that's a resource is that it's, it, you know, just again, trying to think, wow, there's a building down the block from the state hospital. Turns out that in that building is an accessible infinity that will help this person transition out of the hospital. The mouthful. And yet that's the phenomenon of what, what's happening. So as I was preparing this, I, I hadn't looked at the paper we wrote that put out the model in 2010. But this is the last line of the article. We'll recognize success when someone journeys outside of our offices, our clinics, our hospitals, to their own church, synagogue, mosque, temple, or other five sanctified places of ritual filled with diverse, personal, ineffable mysteries that have a utility. So we've got this partnership of differences, right? We're gonna bridge borders and we're gonna hold on to our differences so we can maximize the effect towards social flourishing, right? We're back to, there's a universal humanity and you know, the language I'm speaking about is mental illness is, is pretty broad and doesn't really pick societies or resources. Um, 
as I've done this work in communities, and I was in Mobile, Alabama, working in a community, and I, I amended this. And sure enough, got even more dialogue around, well, what do we mean by universal? Because by using specific language, you end up going deeper into understanding what we share. And so you know, Genesis 20, 27 talks about all being born, you know, B'Tselem Elohim, in the image of God, and talk about trying to wrap your head around. Yet, if we, if we go back to the woman who talked about God not making junk, essentially what she's saying is, I'm part of B'Tselem Elohim. Right? I am part of something that is both me and more than me, and in order to communicate that I'm part of everybody, I'm using something specific to do that. So thank you. And um, I look forward to our continued conversations. I really look forward to Andrew and going from there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Glenn. The camera will pick you up where, wherever you are. It's, it's not so good on further down the room. Good. Well, I'd like to begin on behalf of everyone by thanking Professor Milstein for a paper that I found both clear and important, uh, informative, and opening up onto the interests of so many of us around this table. In fact, each of us, so many of our interests, even individually. I'd like to thank him also for what this paper bears witness to, namely a professional life and personal commitment to exploring and championing the role of religion, religious practice, religious congregations, religious leaders in matters of health and well-being. This is, I know, the tip of, a, of an iceberg, and I really appreciate it. Um, not least in terms of making these bridges opening the borders. Um, and I, I wrote, first of all, um, helping the practice, practitioners of healthcare uh, to have competence in these areas. But then I thought, that's actually, that's not what you're talking about as much as saying they don't need to be experts. There are experts and we don't need to be experts. We, um, we have them to, to call upon. That seems exactly right. Um, and I'm grateful for the way this is set out here in terms of the course of a lifetime. But that was you know, useful for me. Um, and the way in which the personal was understood within the, sort of the wider culture. And I thought that series of, of comments about extraordinary things was well, indeed a, a list of extraordinary things. Uh, and that you mentioned both, both the capacity for religion to be a force of ill as well as good, but here you know, thinking about its capacity for good and that's certainly what we want to, um, to push into. Uh, so I don't so much have a list of uh, questions as topics that seem to me would be generative of further work and discussion. If I can pick up that word, which it belongs to us as adults to be uh, involved in the work of uh, generativity. Um, so one cluster, and I'm gonna to have to rein myself in here because this is so much my, my interest, but is around the idea of the ineffable and the accessible infinite and you know, our participation in the infinite. And um, so when I come across these sorts of terms, I know that in the past, they've quite often been used in terms of religious experience, the experience of the ineffable. Uh, and here I, I, I feel myself pulling back a little bit uh, because I think there's a, has been, I'm not think, I don't think here, maybe not now in psychological work, but there's been a, a tendency to see the ineffable as all about some kind of experience of the ineffable. And I would want to broaden that out and say, this religion is about all of experience. Um, most people, I would think religious people don't go through life swooning all the time, you know? Um, <laughs> And so what is going on? Uh, what is going on there? Well, I think this is a faculty that's done lots of terrific work on themes of mediation and the transcendent and the imminent and the, you know, the, the, the most abstract and its, and its enactment in, in bodies and rituals and forms of community and that sort of thing. So I just think there's a lot over a year for us to talk about, mm -hmm. about what these things mean. So when I think about communities I've been belong to and I thought, so when I belonged to a house church, most of it was pretty effable most of the time, you know. <laughs> and so, um, and I think about, um, you know, even just the variety within my own Christian tradition, that an, an Orthodox congregation might really stress the unknowability of God. A, a house church might not have that category at all. 
1662 community service is going to look quite different from, you know, so I, I, I'm quite interested, I'll come back to this in a minute, about uh, how much diversity there is here and, and whether one can really you know, sum it up. But um, so I'm interested here in, uh, is this a category of experience, the, this ineffableness, is it of knowledge, is that kind of ontological category that's doing its work in the background? Um, I think there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, and how universal is this to religion? Um, is it a useful shorthand? Is it a necessary shorthand that we should have these things that, that can bracket things together? But what, what do we risk missing or kind of sandpapering over? Um, especially if I think of my own tradition, there's a great deal of difference here. And I'm sure there would be between, between traditions. Um, and sort of on that, um, and does that make a difference in terms of the kind of work that you're doing here? Um, and although you didn't particularly talk about it, I know we've, we've talked about chaplaincy and pastoral care and things like that. And I'm interested to hear from you about to what extent these are, we should think of these as univocal sorts of terms, or is there, an, is there a danger of a kind of equivocity here? Um, is there a danger perhaps um, from an American or, or British situation of saying there are these things, chaplaincy, pastoral care, uh, congregation, <clears throat> perhaps assuming something like a like mainstream Christian sort of perspective and then uh, um, not in Pope, but using that as the model which one understands other forms of, of, of Christianity and other religions. And is there, a, you know, how, how so it does something like chaplaincy, for instance, exist across the board, or is it something actually very specific? And is there a danger in them um, in extrapolating there? Not, not that you have done that today. Um, so these are just a, a, a quick scattergun set of comments of things that really uh, struck me. Your comment about consent and referral seemed to me absolutely Im tremendously important. And in my own experience as a curate, um, I know that there will be people in the parish who would be admitted to hospital, their religion would be absolutely central to them, it'd be absolutely central to their recovery and the way they processed what was going on, but no one thought to ask them, or they were not in a position to be able to talk about it. So people have wrist bracelets and things, you know, say these sorts of things, but most people don't. And it would be days later before I found, I couldn't even make a referral to the hospital chaplain. Now, consent is clearly really important here, but I think um, it's an area where just like the, the swipe of a bureaucratic pen can have repercussions that are enormously important. And it's not even out of malice, it's just that these haven't been thought about. And I think the, the work you're doing here, edu educating not just the practitioners, but also the people who make the rules uh, is, is really important. I thought about the case of the recent MP who was murdered, um, Ames, uh, and the fact that there was a priest nearby who was wanting to come and give him the last rites and the police didn't have the, did, said, no, you can't, you can't come. And there's some discussion in parliament now about having a change to the law that allows religious leaders to have access to people who are dying in that kind of situation. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I, I guess my religious perspective is I'd rather die now with the last rites than I would, you know, in rich old age without them. So this is really important stuff. Um, and it's interesting that it's, you know, it's come into the public uh, view at the moment and it's even perhaps before parliament. So your work of education is really important there. I wondered whether old age is a separate stage, and given that you were talking about some things that bear upon old age, whether that's uh, what difference that would make. Um, with re respect to the numbers of denominations, I did wonder if that was a bit of a red herring, in as much as, you know, my own tradition, Church of England Council is one denomination, but between St Andrew the Great and Little St Mary's, you know, you're, there's, there's a greater diversity there than you would find between two um, to registered denominations. And similarly, there'll be plenty of denominations that, that count differently, but actually have very similar. Uh, so I think the, the bulk numbers are important, but I think the number of congregations there is more important, I think, than the number of um, denominations. It did get me wondering about, this is, you're talking about education of um, clinical practitioners. I wonder about the role of theological education in congregations though, because I, I think it's probably the case that what I, from my tradition, would call catechesis, um, and there are plenty of parallels in other traditions, is a bit of a, in a parlous state in my own tradition. I think people are, are much less well informed about their, the resources of their tradition. Think of the a bishop in, um, in, uh, North, in Ireland, um, Jeremy Taylor, who wrote Rules for Holy Living and Rules for Holy Dying. And the idea that uh, preparation for death was massively important. Uh, in our, in, in, I think probably across our tradition, certainly in Christianity, the idea now that one of the things, it, well, it says in the ordinal of the, that ordains people, one of the things that your job to do is to do as priests is prepare people for their death. I think that you know has really fallen by the wayside. So I think part of what's interesting here is not just educating clinical uh, 
in clinical settings and clinical practitioners. But what's changed even in our own educational practices within congregations, and is that making a difference? Uh, so I'm going to, to wind up just with one more thought, which is about that first biggest uh, hexagon. Mm -hmm. Timothy Jenkins, Tim Jenkins, who was a uh, reader here and, um, and I suspect sometimes comes to these um, seminars, was Dean of Chapel at Jesus College. And he had put a great emphasis, I know, I think we all do, but he put, brought it into words on, I think, what he called preemptive pastoral care. And I really want to emphasize uh, how important that is. For me, as a, a Dean of a college ch chapel and having a kind of college role that's as important for me as also the, the cr more crisis uh, based things and in, in fact probably between me and the chaplain we do much more of that community building sort of work than we I mean he especially the chaplain is there to be knocked on his door in the middle of the night and so on that's very important but in a sense like you said if you've done your work properly and there's nothing to see for it and uh, but I thought actually I know you're interested in Cambridge colleges and a Cambridge college might not be a bad example of how that doesn't go unnoticed because people 40 years later are wanting to come back they still have these memories and I think the things that make the college experience so happy for them amongst other things are all the things that also are the preemptive um, pastoral care there so that's like a window on that um, but I just think it's easy to uh, like you said you said fine I'm going to make it's easy to, to skip over that um, and, and I know you're interested in thinking perhaps about Cambridge colleges and, for instance, looking at patterns of referrals. And I just, I think that's a great thing to look at, but I think it might miss 90% of the work. Um, but I'm sure you're, you're uh, onto that. So your universal box, preemptive pastoral care, is, um, is so important and uh, it's easily passed over, but you didn't pass over it. I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you.